Good afternoon, distinguished invitees. We'll now commence the second plenary on defense and strategic studies for the 16th International Research Conference under the theme Digital Digitalization, Sustainability, and Sectoral Transformation. We have five eminent speakers here with us today to present their thoughts and ideas on our theme for the conference. Without a doubt, this will be an interesting and intellectually stimulating session. I would like to call upon Dr. Sana De Silva to introduce the chairperson for the second plenary session. First of all, I would like to apologize for the little delay in starting, but we will be faring on safely for the next few hours. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce this chairperson today because I personally like him a lot. And also he's one of the most veteran foreign service diplomats we have ever produced in Sri Lanka. He's none other than Mr. HMGS Palihakkara, who's a friend of KDU for a long time and even a friend of all the academia in Sri Lanka for the past few decades who was helping us a lot. And I'm very glad to have him here to chair this session. Let me introduce him. I mean, I know that he doesn't like long introductions as a person, but let me introduce him because the younger generation should know who he is and they should learn from his biography. Mr. Palihakkara has a 37 years of civil and diplomatic service. His last diplomatic assignment abroad was Sri Lanka's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in New York from 2008 and 2009. He served as a commissioner on the Presidential Commission on Reconciliation and Lessons Learned, commonly known as LLRC. And he was the chairman of UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters, United Nations Headquarters, New York in 2012. He's the president of Sri Lanka, uh, sorry, the president of Sri Lanka appointed him as a governor of the Northern Province in February 2015. And I've heard many stories, very positive stories about how he tried his best to provide uh, or, or develop this area without claiming a, a single, you know, um, claim on his behalf. And he generally does lectures on all prominent international relations institutes and universities in Sri Lanka. Mr. Palihakkara uh, got his bachelor's of education, uh, you know, he's a graduate of B.Ed. in 1968 from University of Ceylon, Peradeniya. And he received public service commission appointment to Sri Lanka public service in 1969. And he entered Sri Lanka Foreign Service in 1979 and underwent diplomatic training in Australia in 1980. And he was a UN Disarmament Fellow in 1980s. This is the most interesting part of his career. Mr. Palihakkara previously served as Sri Lanka's Ambassador and Permanent Representative to United Nations in Geneva and the leader of Sri Lanka Delegation to Human, Human Rights Commission and the Conference on Disarmament the UN Multilateral Negotiating Body on International Arms Control and Security Matters. His contribution in this area is immense as a leader of, uh, actually he's a global leader in disarmament. So he was Sri Lanka's ambassador to Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and permanent representative to Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific, ESCAP, Bangkok 2000 to 2004. During the period 2002 to 2003, he functioned as the act, uh, Acting Gen Director General and Deputy Di Director General of the Sri Lanka Government Peace Secretariat, SCOP. He was the Director General, United Nations and Multilateral Affairs in the Foreign Ministry, Sri Lanka from 1995 to 1997, covering areas like human rights, preventive diplomacy, peace building, arms control and non-proliferation matters. Without taking much time, sir, I would be very honorable, uh, uh, honorable to ask you to come to the stage. 
to do the needful. Thank you, sir. I too, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I too would like to apologize for the delay and uh, <clears throat> Delay has been aggravated by my friend uh, taking a longer time to introduce me. Uh, and so I will have to cut short my uh, words uh, as well. Uh, may I, uh, uh, first of all, uh, ask uh, uh, the, should we ask the fellow uh, uh, speakers to join us on the, on the podium? Uh, at this uh, time, please. I will introduce uh, our distinguished uh, panel of speakers as we go along. Um, so let us, uh, given the time constraints, uh, let us go straight to our business. I had some um, uh, notes uh, to make some brief opening remarks, but I will dispense with that because of the time factor and also particularly because of uh, the wealth of uh, knowledge and experience uh, uh, I gathered from uh, talking to them just before the meeting, taking advantage of the uh, delay in the meeting. Um, our uh, theme for the session uh, is uh, digitalization, sustainability, and sectoral transformation. So I uh, don't want to uh, uh, overemphasize the importance and complexity of uh, digitalization as it uh, affects uh, almost all parts of uh, modern human life. Um, except to say that it, is, it has become an omnipresent uh, phenomenon and that uh, the task, especially for uh, developing countries like Sri Lanka, is a defining task to ascertain as to how they ought to position themselves in this complicated and complex array of um, uh, impacts that uh, digitalization has brought about and will bring about uh, on, uh, on a range of things that we do uh, from uh, production, consumption, uh, economics to geopolitics and so forth and the controversies and uh, the dangers sometimes uh, that these uh, developments entail uh, especially with regard to the latest uh, developments like artificial intelligence. As we speak here, there is a meeting in New York struggling with the uh, international treaty uh, uh, to address, uh, address how to deal with the issue of uh, artificial intelligence. So, uh, without... Uh, 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 much ado, let me uh, go straight to the subject and uh, introduce you uh, to you the uh, first uh, speaker uh, who will uh, speak uh, to the to the topic Indo-Pacific yeah, Indo-Pacific implications for South Asian region. Uh, 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 we have a very distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, and Chimbo, I hope I pronounce your name correct, uh, who is a very distinguished professor at Kyo University, uh, Faculty of Policy Management in Japan. He served as a special advisor uh, to the Minister of Defense uh, at the Ministry of uh, Defense of Japan. Uh, and also served as a special um, senior advisor to the National Security uh, Secretariat, uh, providing uh, expert advice on, um, among other things, international security, Japan-US uh, security relations, 
Japanese foreign uh, and defense policy, multilateral security, etc. He has also actively contributed uh, to many government uh, commissions and other uh, entities. Uh, he has uh, not been um, quiet on the academic front. His uh, policy insights and analysis have been featured in many uh, reputed the publications of uh, well-respected organizations all over the world. And uh, I have great pleasure, uh, uh, Professor uh, Chimbo, to invite you uh, to uh, speak to that topic. Please, you have the floor. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairperson Palihakara, uh, for a kind introduction. And uh, let me begin by thanking uh, KDU for kindly uh, inviting me to this uh, very important uh, gathering. Um, this is my first time trip to Sri Lanka. And uh, obviously, I'm a novice player here uh, in this country and also for uh, the whole region. So. I hope this, uh, I, I could really capitalize uh, this opportunity to learn more uh, about your country uh, and the dynamics that is going on uh, in this region. As a chairperson uh, has kindly introduced, um, the topic that I, that I would like to talk about uh, is the emergence uh, of the Indo-Pacific as a strategic uh, concept. And I, I could, if I could touch upon digitalization, sustainability, sexual transformation in context of how this regional uh, dynamics uh, takes place, um, uh, I will try my best to do so. Um, from the perspective of Northeast Asia, where Japan uh, is resided, uh, there has been the different types of the regional concept uh, emerged back and forth uh, since 1980s. We began by uh, promoting the concept called the Asia Pacific in 1980s. Uh, as a result of Asian economic miracle that is taking place uh, in East Asia, uh, everybody wished to broaden uh, the concept to uh, engage themselves uh, into this uh, economic dynamism under the concept of the open regionalism, where we created uh, the summit meeting called the APEC, Asia Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation in the 80s. But in 1990s, as you, many of you are aware, that uh, Asia encountered so-called the financial crisis, uh, there has been a huge mismatch between the capital flows in the market vis-a-vis uh, -vis the very immature uh, financial standards that have uh, in mainly in Southeast Asia, but also in beyond. Who actually helped uh, the situation and uh, offer those rescue package was accidentally that was ASEAN plus three format. ASEAN is a set 10 countries in Southeast Asia, plus Japan, uh, uh, Korea, and also China has come up with their own solution called the Chiang Mai Initiative uh, Currency Swap Mechanism. And that really created the huge confidence uh, over the regional settlements and the regional capacity to deal with their own problems. And that led to the process of creating its own political dynamics called the East Asian Summit in 2005. And then what happened was that uh, whether the East Asian Summit could be the automatic translation from the ASEAN plus three, there was a huge debate in mid 2000 and they came up with uh, expanding solution by inviting Australia, India, and New Zealand into that processes. And the story never ended there. Because of the constant rise of China, and the people felt that the institutional balancing under this scheme uh, would be never been enough. So many people in those uh, scheme of the East Asian Summit have thought that we should add powerful player uh, into this dynamics and then the East Asian Summit has invited uh, United States and Russia as a counterbalancing, but uh, become a major player in the East Asia multilateral dynamics. So these are the brief sketch of the stories of the decades of the developments of the East Asian regional uh, framework. But in 2010s, we are now getting into the era of Indo-Pacific as a gravity concept. But why we, we, we call it gravity? Because everybody now calls, calls, calls the, uh, you know, the copyright about uh, what the you know, in, Indo-Pacific uh, really means uh, in, in this uh, part, of the, uh, part of the region. And why do we care about the Indo-Pacific? I think there are a couple of reasons. Especially there are the 
uh, the geopolitical and geoeconomic reality uh, that really represents uh, Indo-Pacific as a strategic concept. Opportunities are there as you, uh, it's, it's very self-evident. If you look at uh, IMF World Economic uh, Outlook, uh, there has been, uh, you know, the world has been struggling uh, to find how they can really achieve uh, the economic recovery after the COVID. But uh, Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, everybody had the problem. And the recently, you, you have heard the, the news that the China also encounter the huge internal problems on the economy. But if you look at the South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, uh, and, and also the Bangladesh, uh, and the, you know, in the Middle East and Eastern Africa, there's a huge potential in the coming decades that the region will perform the high economic growth. And everybody should like to, you know, uh, plug and play to this economic uh, dynamism. And this is the why that the Indo-Pacific has come into the play of the, uh, the regional importance. But at the same time, we also have a huge challenges. Uh, one is the return of geopolitics. I think that the globalism, globalization movement uh, have now into the huge review because of the geopolitics came back into the place, not only into the defense and security domain, but also in the economic domain as well. With the rise of the economic security concerns, uh, we also have to deal with uh, how we can really recast our economic uh, you know, sanctions, uh, export control policy, high-tech transfer issues, uh, public procurement policies, and those have to be really strategized uh, in a way to conduct our private sector activities. So the private sector is no longer free under the globalization, but it has been uh, interfered uh, hugely uh, through the geoeconomics. And then I think that uh, the elephants in the room is always China in the wider context, but also India and many, uh, other players are also uh, on the rise. And then we are now trying to pursue so-called a dual track uh, strategy in this uh, rapidly changing uh, power dynamics. One definitely is a competitive strategy. And I think a competitive strategy um, in, in, in the defense and security domain, it is about the deterrence. How we can really recraft the deterrence into the new uh, dynamics is a, definitely the essential uh, topic to be uh, discussed. And this is the, the, the exactly the reason why Japan has came up with a new national security strategy in this December with a, a surprising kind of a decision that we made to double the size of the defense budget. And then we procure uh, something uh, is much more historically uh, really going beyond uh, what uh, you think as a uh, you know, peaceful country that we are. We are now obtaining a long strike capability, uh, long, long range strike capability and then to focus more alignment uh, with the United States to have a joint operation together uh, to secure the stability in Northeast Asia. On the economics, uh, as I mentioned, that there are French shoring processes, how much we can really align ourselves in the standard of the business practices in line with what the strategy really, uh, you know, lead us. So that, uh, you know, digitalization is the one of the, uh, I think, the subject of the economic security. What kind of digital standards are we going to adapt for the next rounds of the you know, digital, digital reform is the matter of the geopolitics. And this is, I think, uh, quite an important thing to, to play out. We could be, private sector would be much more happy if there are no pressure to choose sites, uh, if the, those the platforms could be common. But uh, unfortunately, the, there has been the digital standards device uh, everywhere uh, in this world, so that the, any kind of choice that the, that the country or the private sector makes has its own connotation with a geopolitical choice uh, as well. And these are the competitive strategy. We also have a cooperation strategy. We are not 100% competing China, and we are not 100% competing India, or any kinds of like a geopolitical uh, you know, competition has been going on. What makes difference uh, between the Cold War competition and the today's competition is that we are heavily interconnected uh, with each other on the economic domain. Every country's you know, first trading partner might be China, and that, that is true for Japan. Even though we have adopted the so-called economic security promotion law to, you know, conduct ourselves in a much tighter economic, uh, ex, uh, economic export control policy uh, that, that, uh, that which has uh, China into the first priority in, in their mind, but 
In 2002, statistics shows that uh, the commodity trade has been booming and the record high between uh, Japan and China. This is the very hard to comprehend. You know, we have a robust economic relationship, but we also have to heighten our competitive strategy uh, with our countries uh, of concern. So these are, the, I think, the essential component of why Indo-Pacific matters uh, for many of us, including countries like Sri Lanka. And let me just to point out what would be the major, uh, I think, agenda uh, to be uh, that, that to be discussed uh, in in our, uh, I think, further discussion. One is definitely uh, the security and defense, and I think that uh, it's not a hidden uh, tacit agenda at all. But I think that uh, you know how we can we keep. United States presence in to the wider Indo-Pacific is everybody's uh, concern. And the United States definitely tried to promote so-called integrated deterrence allies and partnership approaches. So it is not about the multilateralization like an uh, Asian version of NATO that everybody has a, a kind of a responsibility to act uh, on the mutual defense commitment, but it is more like, uh, uh, you know, the alignment a la cult. We do share a lots of like a standards of the safety and the risk assessment and the burden sharing, but uh, the actual operation that is taking place in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, Malacca Strait, and Indian Ocean can be customized in a very flexible manner. And these are the something that we really need to craft in a much more sophisticated way in order to have a stable uh, balance of power in this region. In particular sense that I would like to f highlight is the not only the high level uh, concern that we have such as in the Taiwan Strait, how to deal with the high end contingency is particularly what Japan is currently working on, but in the whole region, something that we also need to cultivate is the standards uh, of the lower level, uh, I think, risk uh, management, especially on the maritime domain. So definitely we need to cultivate the capacity of the maritime policing, uh, coast guards, uh, law enforcement uh, capacities, and those are essentially important to manage the lower level stability because something we don't want to ha see is that the country who are, uh, uh, you know, very vulnerable from the, the uh, to, to be coerced by one nation or some country try to respond solely by the military and not through the, those uh, policing activity. It's a highly escalatory way of management. We definitely have a law enforcement capacity which is not sufficient in this Indo-Pacific region. And the second uh, aspect that I also would like to have is the, the kind of a development standards that involves the infrastructure development, project financing, and the how to create the business environment that is suitable uh, for many uh, countries and business uh, people uh, in this region. And I think that uh, Sri Lanka has been, been the, the example that everybody is now very curious to uh, investigate. And I think that every country in this region try to promote so-called strategic autonomy freedom of decision, freedom of the choice, which is conducive to your national uh, security. And the freedom and the strategic autonomy cannot be achieved if you are stand alone. You are going to align with somebody else, but those kind of alignment should not be, I think, one-sided. This is, I think, the way you, I, I think everybody try to achieve the strategic autonomy in that sense. If you align together with country A, B, C in a multi kind of multi kind of perspective, you may have a much more bargaining power to deal with them. You can actually set a good uh, kind of balancing act uh, in dealing uh, with such kind of uh, you know the business uh, relationship. That is the way to secure your freedom and your choices uh, for the future. And these are, I think, uh, quite uh, important. And then that the, uh, the concept of the sustainability uh, is uh, come into play. Uh, what kind of standards are you going to uh, you know, uh, deal with uh, in, in, in the region? And the final aspect that I uh, wish to uh, you know, emphasize uh, as, a, uh, as the um, uh, as a kind of a first presenter uh, is the the role played by the external region to this uh, South Asia. 
And everybody is now trying to come into the Indo-Pacific. Why Europe has Indo-Pacific strategy? Why Latin American countries have an Indo-Pacific strategy? And why somewhere else? Because they need to have a coordinated policy to engage here. You don't want to let the private sector to draw the Indo-Pacific strategy alone. They are actually going to get the profits. They are going to get a better business deal in the country. It doesn't really represent the country's strategy. If you let the military people to go ahead, they are interested in creating the deterrent structure and also the alignment structure, but sometimes that really contradicts with the economic reality. So definitely you need to combine the different sectoral interests into this uh, uh, you know, co uh, context. And I think that the, in that regard, I think how the Sri Lanka and the South, uh, South Asia region are dealing with those kind of external powers is something is much more multi-sectoral, uh, you know, uh, in a way that, uh, you know, intersectoral government, uh, you know, relationship is much more uh, important. And I hope that the, this Indo-Pacific strategy will create a better kind of platform uh, for everybody can plug and play in this region as well. So I'll stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Professor. Uh, and thank you for finishing sharp on time. And I forgot to mention, uh, actually, that each speaker uh, has uh, 15 minutes uh, of time, of course, uh, not strictly enforced. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much uh, for your very insightful and uh, practically also useful remarks, Professor. I believe the next speaker is uh, online. Uh, uh, he is. Uh, he will speak to the uh, topic uh, transformation and drivers of internationalization of higher education, globalization, sustainability, and uh, digitalization. Uh, Mr. Fred Evans, uh, who is, uh, has more than two decades of career in education across East and Southeast Asia, uh, he has uh, contributed significantly to uh, curriculum development and instruction in uh, many countries, France, Japan, China, and Thailand. And during his uh, 15 years tenure at the British Council, much, he sure. held uh, diverse roles, uh, including in uh, countries like Japan, Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, of course in Thailand. Uh, and uh, he has uh, his uh, contributions uh, focused on national and regional <coughs> education programs, internationalizing higher education, uh, fostering partnerships for research and capacity building. So uh, may I please uh, ask uh, Mr. Fred Evans to uh, uh, speak to us uh, now. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And um, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's an honor for me to be presenting here today. And I would uh, like to thank sincerely General Sir John Kotelawala Defense University for this uh, opportunity. Um, I'm going to be talking, um, as mentioned already, on transformations and drivers of internationalization of higher education, IHE, globalization, digitalization, and sustainability. So uh, my presentation will be in three parts. I will start with a discussion on the definitions of internationalization of higher education, or IHE, and current perspectives. And I'll be drawing on historical data globally and in Thailand, where I'm based, to share the picture of how IHE has changed over the last decade or so. And looking into some of the data trends in key IHE activities and international partnerships. I'll then go on to explain the transformation that's taken place uh, in IHE, the globalization and neoliberalism perspective, and how they've shaped the sector itself. I'll also be looking at the digitalization trend and the implications in terms of graduate employability, labor market trends, and the pressure that universities are now under to respond, to prepare graduates, and to contribute to the delivery of the sustainable development goals. And finally, I'll be looking to the future, and I'll sum up by providing my own take on how IHE could be approached in research 
from a more socially constructed, contextual and bottom-up perspective. So what is what actually is internationalization of higher education? Let's begin here. Well, if we start with um, looking at the role of the university over the years, and uh, higher education, of course, has, pl has played a multifaceted role in our society as the world has evolved. And universities, of course, have had to adapt to new cultures, operating environments, and national and global demands as well. So in, in the medieval times, universities basically served state religions. But then moving brings us to the present day, where the key role for universities relates to their contribution to knowledge economies and a globally mobile and more competitive graduate labor market. So this era of economic and information globalization has increased the public demand for university degrees to translate to employment. And universities are driven to shift their traditional um, education models into more commercial models with an internationalized curriculum to attract more international students, thus increasing revenue opportunities. So in terms of the future, futurists basically predict that the education systems of tomorrow will be drastically different from those of today. There are many theoretical definitions about what internationalization actually means in the context of higher education. And this depends on the context, values, philosophy, um, political background and culture, of course, of the people who are defining it. Um, we have here three definitions from three quite well-known experts um, in the field of IHE. Altbach et al. refer to the um, practical, refer to IHE in practical terms as the variety of policies and programs that universities and governments implement to respond to globalization. Then we have Jane Knight from Canada, who's done a lot of work in IHE, who talks about a process of integrating an international, intercultural, or global dimension into the purpose, functions, and delivery of post-secondary education. DeWitt et al., who've also done a lot of work in this field, um, take the emphasis a bit more into the higher quality of education and its relevance to society as a whole. So, essentially, IHE, what are, what are the key elements? Well, the core of IHE is the transfer of knowledge across borders, and the key elements of this are related to international student mobility and internationalized programs. So a lot of the research and the work on IHE tends to focus a lot on student mobility or the curriculum itself. So we have internationalized programs, of course, as one core element, a response to global inter interdependencies and the need to address global needs and public concern through education collaboration and institutional partnerships. And then we have, of course, international student mobility. So students enrolling at academic institutions across national borders come to this stage, come to this exponential growth. What were the drivers in the higher education sector that led to higher education delivery crossing national boundaries as well? And um, here we have the, the main drivers, of course, of globalization and neoliberal, um, neoliberalism. In the 1980s, of course, Western neoliberal capitalism and the concept of a free uh, market, competitive free market, together with globalization, basically created and shaped the global concept of IHE as we know it today. And IHE is often seen as a response also to globalization. It's seen as a key force and a context that's basically reshaping the role and institutional structure of higher education. And it's argued by many scholars that the necessity of income generation, driven by these neoliberal principles, has led to a prioritization of the business side of tertiary education at the expense of the fundamental goals of education in terms of teaching and learning. This forms a large part of the literature. All of this, of course, has led over recent decades to a plethora of new business-oriented approaches. Uh, we've already mentioned uh, one example, the international students who often pay tuition fees that are several times more than home country students. So basically, at the core of this philosophy of economic liberalism is the application of techniques from the private sector, uh, where, um, in which organizations in the public se sector are managed. So we've seen this big shift um, in higher education. And globalization and neoliberalism um, 
have essentially uh, led to the opening up of higher education to borderless education and more competitive as well. But we also have digitalization and also sustainability. And I just want to refer to these. The digitalization itself is included within globalization and re represents, of course, the advantages of information and digital technologies. And this is creating greater access to education, new markets for distribution, and expanded income opportunities as well for higher education institutions. So um, as we know, in today's educational marketplace, students are getting more and more accustomed to instant access at any time, any place to their education. In terms of sustainability, a lot of the discourses on, on higher education tell us that universities can do more and should be doing more to deliver against the SDGs, working with faculty, staff and students, as well as other stakeholders. And universities play a critical role in developing and in helping shaping new ways for the world, in educating global citizens and delivering knowledge and innovation into society. So these changes, these drivers bring challenges and opportunities for universities in order to stay relevant and viable. So let's look a little bit, um, I'm aware of the time, but let's look at digitalization and sustainability. What we're seeing is a big shift towards services as the major forces driving the change in labor markets for highly skilled workers in Asia. We're seeing a shift from manufacturing to services industry. We're seeing basically the digitalization of everything. In Malaysia, for example, 83% of the total population can be classified as digital customers. And digitalization expected to drive job creation in the wholesale and retail, manufacturing, and hospitality industries. In China, there are more than 800 million mobile payment users, but 77% of jobs in China are at risk of being, a being replaced by automation one day. There's also a skills gap. And um, for example, in the same country, China, it reportedly lacks nearly 30 million skilled workers. So workers of the future need to possess three types of skills to thrive in the modern workplace. Um, and these are core skills, soft skills and digital skills. The British Council has defined these six core skills as critical thinking and problem solving, communication and collaboration, creativity and imagination, student leadership, citizenship and digital literacy. And then we have the soft skills and of course the importance of digital skills, the use of digital devices, communication applications and networks to access and manage information. So while these key labor trends across East Asia uh, are taking place, one British Council study has provided recommendations on how UK universities can respond. And I think these, this is applic applicable to uh, most countries and to most universities faced with this situation. So this report suggests that we should be guiding students to the subject areas and industries in greatest need of skilled workers in the future. We should be better integrating, as universities, the needs of industry in the teaching of academic institutions to improve the competitiveness of graduates. And we should be developing soft skills and lifelong learning techniques in our students. I have a slide here, which I'm not going to spend too long on, but it's just examples of some of the um, digitalization uh, we've been working on as an university at Tamasat and in my faculty uh, of social administration. You can see the different areas there. I'm not going to go through this due to the constraints of time, but you can see that we, that as with most universities, I'm sure you can see uh, this is mirrored in most universities now, more and more online academic partnerships. We're enhancing the curriculum through technology, uh, using the digitalizing of teaching and learning, and enhancing the student experience. And uh, especially also in the practical sense of internships as well, it's been very interesting how that has been um, Progressing. Sustainability at a strategic level is important. Um, an intentional and aspirational strategy to um, develop, uh, to develop, to emphasize, and to come up with a framework for approaching the SDGs. And uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I am aware of the time. Uh, partnerships within and with universities can help accelerate, of course, the delivery of the SDGs 
as contributors to the knowledge base, but also as implementers. What is therefore the future of IHE? Well, the IHE of the future will be looking at building collaborative alliances, more so than now, becoming more business-like entrepreneurs by marketing themselves more. Universities need to prepare to be resilient to emerging disruptive technologies. There will be the need to balance the economic versus the social responsibility aspects and roles of universities, and also there'll be the expanding, of course, and diversifying of the student base. So just to conclude my um, presentation today, and I do apologize if I've run over time, um, it is essential that we look at the social process and social context in which IHE takes place. And um, this is something that uh, has inspired me. The theories of Williams et al. concentrate less on the more normative definition of IHE, but on IHE as the process which is constructed at the local level in, in different contexts across the world, uh, a process which is fluid and not determined by any specific um, definitions, as we saw earlier, which are very much Western um, focused. So escaping prescription of any kind is important, and this is the kind of approach to IHE, I believe, which will allow us to um, negotiate meaning at the local contextual level. Finally, I find this non-normative focus extremely helpful because it allows us to see IHE as a process which is constructed within social context. It allows us to interpret and understand IHE within each unique context. And so, my, in my case, uh, as a study, uh, right now I'm studying uh, the PhD, in my PhD, how in, at an institutional level, within a developing country context, such a process is taking place, and um, I'm going to be basing my research and looking at it from this theoretical viewpoint, which really takes the social uh, uh, process and local context into <coughs> consideration. So apologies for going over the time, um, and these are my references. I would like to thank you uh, for, for listening to me, and I look forward to taking any questions later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Evans, for that uh, fact-filled uh, uh, presentation and taking for taking the trouble uh, virtually uh, to contribute to this event. Uh, thank you very much. Um, next uh, speaker uh, is Dr. Rajiv Ranjan. He will uh, speak to the topic, uh, the technological order artificial intelligence and great power rivalry. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Ranjan uh, he is, uh, is um, Assistant Professor, Department of East Asian Studies, uh, University of Delhi, and he is a fellow at the Institute of uh, Chinese Studies, Delhi, and Associate Professor, uh, Institute of Global Studies, Shanghai University, uh, he um, has. Uh, he is also a fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. Uh, he was a research fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi, and a visiting senior scholar at the School of Political Science and Public um, Administration, Shandong University, China. He has uh, written. Uh, widely, especially on uh, China, South Asia, China, India uh, context. Uh, and uh, he has uh, published a number of uh, uh, widely read uh, publications uh, on, uh, on global affairs. He holds a PhD in Chinese studies and an MA in politics uh, from the JNU, prestigious JNU. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rajiv, uh, you have the floor. Yeah, please. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. You can link it up, right?
think you'll be here. Okay, okay. Thank you, Chair, uh, Ambassador Palihakara, for kind introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, KDU for giving me this opportunity to interact with young cadets and students here. Uh, although this is my first time here at KDU, but uh, I'm no stranger to Sri Lanka. I have been many times to Sri Lanka. Uh, since morning, we are keep hearing about artificial intelligence, and now I'm going to talk a little about how this artificial intelligence will intensify the great power rivalry. Uh, as we know, that the technology has capability to change the norms and order. So what I'm going to do today here is uh, I have divided my whole presentation in four parts. The first part, I'm going to uh, discuss about the order, the international order and the technology, the first part. And then I would be talking about how China is progressing or investing in artificial intelligence and catching up with United States. The second, the third part, I will be dealing with the India in United States, investment and research in AI. And then in the last part, I try to draw upon how the India and United States are cooperating in this artificial intelligence. Now, but before I begin, uh, let me quote uh, Jax Ellul, who says that it is incorrect to say that economic politics and a sphere of culture are influenced or modified by the technique. But rather, they all are situated in it, a novel situation that modifies all the traditional social content, concepts. In other way, we are not, the techni techniques are not influencing, but we are situated in it. So there is no choice but to save by the technological revolution. And we have seen from millennia that how technology has changed the order. Uh, and then we talk about John Galton, one of the famous a scholar who uh, kind of established peace and conflict studies. He says that the technology is not merely a mode of production, therefore neutral. It carries within a code of a structure. That means the technology is, is also biased, right? The other day, uh, Prime Minister, Indian Prime Minister Modi uh, addressing at Business 2020, uh, he said that there is a biasness in algorithms. And thereby, we need to have a global governance to govern this artificial intelligence. Now, as we know that for centuries, technology has altered the existing world order. For example, we all know we are living in a nuclear world order, right? And there is a divide. We have N5 and non-nuclear states. There is categorically a two world order, one with the nuclear and one without the nuclear. Are we for a kind of like we are uh, predicting the another world order where we will have a two artificial intelligence dominated world order? How this artificial intelligence is going to influence or save this order? For example, like in 1400 BC, when the revolution of chariot changed the balance of power in Egypt, India, and China. In seventh century, even the whole source of change. So even any minor technical or technique revolution can change the course of future. And artificial intelligence, we all know, and artificial intelligence has very powerful means to alter our imagination. Unlike the nuclear power, which doesn't have this social penetration, this artificial intelligence is, 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 we all are aware of how artificial intelligence can change our lives. And we know, now I think all of you are a cadet and you must be uh, familiar with the chat GPT, uh, how the students are now using the chat GPT to submit their assignment, right? It's, it's, it skills the, the creativity of the students. It's not only kills the creativity, but it also 
At the same time, the chat GPT is revolutionizing the whole concept of education. And thereby, the whole concept of this AI is a dual use technology. Now, the question arises before us that how we are going to use this AI. And now, there is a converging interest among the world leaders that we should accelerate the process to have this global governance, global norms to dictate the use of artificial intelligence. I think in the morning we, 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 we heard that this artificial intelligence where the private player is also have a big role to play. Right? It's not one of the state, but this, the non-state actors also have a very, very significant role in artificial intelligence. So now coming back to how this is going to impact the world order that we live. Uh, and there are different definitions of world order also. Uh, one of the famous uh, political scientists, John Ackenberry, defines that post-World War, we have this organized the whole economic op uh, structure around the open economy, free trade, multilateral institutions, and democratic stability. The Chinese scholars, exa uh, for example, like Fu Ying, does not agree with this concept of world order or international order. They, they, the Chinese scholar categorically differentiate between what is international order and what is world order. For them, the world order is what the US built after the uh, World War II on the basis of dollar and the military allies. For Chinese, they are happy with the international order that to, to rally behind the United Nations and other multilateral institutions. Uh, Wang Qi Si is a professor, very widely known professor at Peking University. He says that the international order contains power structures and the strength of the, the, the major powers, and thereby they build a norm. For example, you have a WTO norms, or United Nations, even the global industrial supply chain will uh, impact it heavily, and one who will be controlling the AI will be winning the uh, global supply chain. Now, this is uh, the chart prepared by the Brookings uh, Institute who say that who are the leaders and who are ready for AI uh, uh, revolution. And now if you see that, you have India and China with, because AI needs data. And being a populist country in the world, India and China is leading, right? Then you have people prepared for AI with Singapore and Sweden, the smaller countries. Technologically prepared is the United States is leading the rank. But China is not lagging far behind. And I think uh, there are research that's saying that within five to 10 years, China will be number one AI innovator and will be holding the largest patent in the world in AI field. And I said, the AI is a dual use technology. It has also, one can use it in own favor. It can even exploit the situation. If you look at here, when we go, uh, even the traffic is now, the AI helps us which route to take, which route to avoid, right? So our daily lives are also influenced by this AI. And this is a German artist. He used uh, kind of like tricked the whole Google map to show that when uh, he, he did a kind of like for artist's purpose, but it was showing the limitation of AI, that it can be used or algorithms can be biased, can be modified, can be altered for, and we know about some uh, speakers in the previous section also talked about that how Russia-Ukraine war we have seen the use of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence can, uh, even uh, whole narratives around the war can be changed, right? So it's a, it's, it's a dual use technology and the country around the world has to come forward to have a global norms about, and I think Chair has already talked that uh, while we speak, there is a, uh, in, in United States there is a, uh, uh, convention going on to kind of like reach at any agreement. 
Now, this whole era in China, uh, we have this uh, Chinese scientist, Kai Fu Li. Uh, he wrote a very uh, interesting book. Uh, uh, I uh, recommend to all the uh, students uh, to, of the KDU to read this book, AI Superpower, China, Silicon, and New World Order by Kai Fu Li. Uh, I think uh, because of the lack of time, I think I should... No, no, three more minutes. Oh, three more minutes. So what, what I'm going to do is, I think it's, it's just from the book, so I would suggest you to read this book, and I will skip some of the uh, uh, slides here to go back to, to like how China is doing. Like if you look at uh, in 2020, 143 billion chips sold in China, uh, around like everything is now with China, like China is investing too much. Like Chinese search engine, uh, Giant Pi2 has completed a round of financing for this Kulun AI chip unit which is valued unit at around $2 billion. Uh, in 2017, China came up with China, uh, China's AI policy. At the same time, India also came with the AI policy. Uh, United uh, Kingdom came with the AI and invested, uh, promised to invest $1.2 in France in 2020. They promised to invest $1.8 billion in AI. I will not go into uh, in detail about the China AI policy. And these are like some of the uh, China's AI policy, how they are going to develop this AI to, to compete with United States. Uh, I will skip this also. A lot of time. Okay. Uh, let me skip a lot of slides. Uh, since I come from India, so let me uh, speak a little bit about India. Uh, in, as I said, in 2018, India's uh, Niti Aayog, uh, uh, formerly known as uh, Planning Commission, also came with uh, a policy paper known as National Strategy for Artificial Intelligence. But here, again, the focus area is limited to traditional sector, traditional field, that is healthcare, agriculture, education, smart cities, uh, right? So there is not much talk about the use of artificial intelligence in military, artificial intelligence in cyberspace, artificial intelligence and also like changing the narrative or influencing the narratives. Uh, and there are also like challenges. This AI paper also talked about uh, as a demo democratic, one of the democratic country in India, they talked about because in a democratic country like India and United States, the, the most uh, challenge for private sector or even for government is the concern for privacy, right? If you talk about in, in China, they are more, uh, there is not much concern about uh, privacy. Uh, as long as they are feel safe and secure, there is a very good article by Graham Ellison who talks about that how the two uh, population in the United States and in China, they differ on the concept of privacy and the safety. Uh, if you talk to any common uh, uh, US citizen, they would be preferring the privacy rather than the security, right? But if you talk to the Chinese, they would more uh, safe uh, and secure rather than talking about the, the privacy. So, and thereby, the Chinese have this uh, data uh, because everything is now uh, controlled, a kind of thing. Uh, surveillance is there, so they have a kind of like, uh, data is like amply available. And for AI, you need data. Kai Fu Li in book says that even though you have a talents and you don't have data, you cannot perfect your artificial intelligence. And thereby data becomes a, a your kind of like your criteria to success. Uh, I've already talked about, so let me finish about talking about, this is about the US for uh, how the US has also come with the AI policy and this is how comprehensive and intensively they are going ahead with the AI development. Uh, India and US partnership, and uh, let me talk with one minute and then I will uh, end. Uh, now, given the China, US, China, India rivalry, India and US is also coming to what some of the scholar in AI, they believe that this is going to intensify the zero sum game. We see here a kind of like a partnership emerging in AI, where India and US is also partnering to, to develop AI together. And 
uh, during last visit uh, of Prime Minister to the US, he signed uh, this uh, agreement where they are trying to, to, to kind of maximize because India produces a lot of STEM graduates, you have uh, uh, the science talents, and US, you have all the uh, infrastructure to do that. So thereby, and, and so we see that this is a kind of like critical and emerging technology, which is going to be uh, critical for India-US partnership. And now we have this uh, technology transfer agreement. So India and, uh, India and United States is also looking for using this AI to also not to uh, uh, kind of like uh, in a way that they are coming together to use in a very ethical and in a co for common good rather than using AI as a dominating the human uh, uh, mankind. So there is a very good book by uh, Daniel Bell uh, who says that who will control the AI and how, what should be the hierarchy between the human AI and AI. The book named is Just Hierarchy. So now there will be a question about who will control whom. Right? So I will end here and there is, a, there is also an ethical question once the AI take the center stage. So the hierarchy will be there what the Daniel Bale says, that the human should be controlling the AI and not the AI should be controlling the human. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Rajiv. Uh, and, and also, it's, uh, it's a relief to hear your, hear your last comment, uh, that the humans will, after all, control the AI. So, um, next, uh, we have, uh, have uh, Mr. Kevin uh, Price, uh, who will talk to us on how the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, supports uh, resilience in Sri Lanka. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kevin Price uh, is a senior diplomat of the United States uh, Department of State, currently working uh, in the, in a, as a senior member of the U.S. Embassy in Colombo, uh, political economic uh, affairs uh, um, uh, department, uh, a graduate in uh, political science and a holder of uh, MA in International Development. He has had uh, more than a decade uh, of experience in dealing with uh, international development and political and strategic issues as they relate to the U.S. and global interests, of course. He therefore brings, uh, in a way, practitioner's perspective to the discussion uh, here uh, as he is uh, built to speak on the U.S. Uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, I believe. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Am I on? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at KDU. And I have to admit, I feel a little bit out of my league being on a panel with such big, heavy thinkers. I'm not sure if anyone here is excited to hear from the government bureaucrat, but I greatly <laughs> appreciate the invitation. Uh, and I also want to assure my panel colleague, Dr. Ranjan, that I did not use ChatGPT to organize my remarks. Uh, but as the chairman mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about our Indo-Pacific strategy. And uh, this strategy is really what guides all the work that we do at uh, U.S. Embassy Colombo. And uh, as my uh, other uh, panel colleague mentioned, many countries now have their own Indo-Pacific strategy. The Indo-Pacific, it has really become a buzzword. And even within the US government, we have, uh, in addition to our strategy, we have the Indo-Pacific Business Forum, the Indo-Pacific Environmental Security Forum, uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And it would be really easy to say, ah, Indo-Pacific, it's just a buzzword, it's just words. Uh, it's, it doesn't really mean anything, but I would argue that uh, we're at a stage now where we really are taking our strategy and turning it into action. <clears throat> um, so first off, how do we define the Indo-Pacific strategy? And I think our president said it best. 
Uh, our vision for the Indo-Pacific region is one that is free and open, connected, prosperous, resilient, and secure. And it's our vision, uh, not because we think that is good for the United States, but we think that vision is good for the people and the countries of the Indo-Pacific region that will create the opportunities uh, for the people living here in this Indo-Pacific region if we can make it a free and open region. Uh, so President Biden launched the Indo-Pacific strategy about two years ago. Uh, the previous administration also had their own version of the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. And if you look at the two side by side, they're pretty similar. Uh, one of the key themes, though, in the current strategy, uh, as envisioned by President Biden, uh, is talking about the importance of forging stronger connections, uh, both within and beyond the region. And that's really because we recognize some of these challenges that we're facing, whether it be uh, climate change or pandemics, um, the, the challenges posed by artificial intelligence. Uh, these are challenges that one country cannot face alone, and it's uh, much better if we can form these partnerships to address some of these really the key challenges of the 21st century. Um, and then also, we recognize that so much of the Indo-Pacific strategy is just about being present in the region and having um, a face in the region. And so if you follow the news, you will have seen that just in this year, uh, the United States has opened up new embassies in the Solomon Islands and Tonga. We're planning to open new embassies in Kiribati and Vanuatu. And uh, some of you might have seen that just today, uh, the very first US, embassy, US ambassador to the Maldives uh, presented his credentials to the uh, Maldivian president. So this is the first time the US has had uh, an ambassador specifically just for the Maldives. Um, so like I said, the strategy really is now, it's on paper, and it's not just about the words, but now it is about action. Uh, so let me just give you a couple of examples here. Uh, last month, Sri Lanka, along with the United States, co-hosted the Indo-Pacific Environmental Security Forum. And so that brought together representatives from the US, Sri Lanka, India, Japan, Vietnam, uh, many other countries. And they came together to, to seek solutions to global concerns, because like I said, much easier to work together with our partner countries to address these challenges. And our Ambassador Chong spoke at that event, and I think she summarized uh, it very well by saying, our vision of the world is one where all countries, uh, big and small, have opportunities for success and stability. So whether you're in Fiji or Australia, Mongolia, Sri Lanka, uh, we're all vulnerable to these challenges that the world is facing. Uh, and we've seen that with the recent drought in Sri Lanka uh, that's impacting food security. And so it's really important to uh, come together and share ideas and find creative ways to address uh, these common challenges. And it's uh, because of this, this reason that uh, the United States is supporting uh, environmental security projects, uh, both within the region but also here in Sri Lanka. Um, we fund the Climate Action Champions Network, which brings people together from Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and they're working to drive climate change policy and programs in South Asia. And so that's an example of uh, the strategy laying out this uh, foundation of encouraging the United States to form partnerships uh, with other countries in the region and really uh, addressing the key problems that we are all facing. And it's great to see uh, Sri Lanka um, taking strong steps uh, towards environmental sustainability. Uh, last year it joined the Global Methane Pledge. Uh, it's focused on developing renewable energy. Uh, it's also working to reduce pollution and waste management. Uh, so we really applaud Sri Lanka for those steps it's taking uh, towards environmental sustainability. Um, but of course, uh, achieving resilience, one of the themes of this, uh, this session, uh, it also requires prosperity. Uh, and so that's why uh, through the Indo-Pacific strategy, we've launched initiatives like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. And that's intended to uh, advance sustainability, inclusiveness, economic growth, uh, and competitiveness for the region's economies. 
Uh, now, of course, we realize, and when I say we, I'm saying the U.S. government, we realize that government alone cannot provide all the answers, cannot provide all the solutions. And that's why we rely heavily on our partners in the private sector. Uh, and so we're proud that uh, U.S. businesses have already provided more than a trillion dollars in uh, foreign direct investment in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and we're working with countries to make more uh, investment-friendly uh, environments so that this uh, inflow can continue. Uh, and that requires uh, strong rules for a digital economy uh, and unlocking opportunities for the region um, to ensure strong data privacy, for example, and security protections. That will help to uh, continue and increase the amount of investment coming from the United States and other countries in the world. Uh, but then coming back to what the U.S. government is doing, we've uh, invested over $2 billion in foreign assistance, um, and we have plans to allocate billions more just in this year alone. Uh, again, turning to our ambassador, um, she mentioned that uh, I think we can all agree that working together to build a prosperous Indo-Pacific region is more critical now than ever, uh, especially when we consider the economic challenges that Sri Lanka has faced in the past year. Um, and it's also important to remember that uh, good economic governance and good political governance go hand in hand if you're going to have a strong... And that's why we're working with our Sri Lankan partners um, to support policies that will strengthen financial institutions here. Um, and we believe that will, in the long term, um, help attract more international investment. Uh, really, we believe that collaboration is the key to building resiliency. Again, one of the themes of our session here today. And so, um, for example, as we face the global challenge of climate change, uh, of course, one country cannot address that by itself. We all need to work together. And so we are partnering with Sri Lanka and other countries around the world um, to encourage renewable energy and uh, also to increase Sri Lanka's ability to adapt to climate change um, in ways that will contribute to sustained economic growth. So again, the United States uh, has a long partnership with Sri Lanka. We're celebrating 75 years of bilateral relations this year, and we're really excited to continue that work, uh, both with Sri Lanka and other countries in the region, to help achieve resilience and build prosperity and bolster security throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Let me stop there. Uh, I am looking forward to hearing from our last panelist, and I also will be looking forward to your questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for finishing ahead of time <laughs> and um, uh, for that uh, insightful uh, commentary. Uh, uh, next, uh, uh, we have uh, Madam uh, C.G. Song. Uh, she is the uh, she's, uh, uh, coordinator. Uh, Program Coordinator for the Indian Ocean East Team of the Global uh, Maritime um, Crime Program. And uh, she's a legal expert uh, with a master's degree in public international law, international humanitarian law, and law of the sea and maritime security. She um, assumed uh, the present uh, incumbency uh, in December 2022, and she has been working with UNODC since 2015. Uh, she worked for different uh, UNODC programs, uh, a senior in the program, country and regional officers in East, West, and Central Africa. And, uh, and uh, she has uh, been a human rights focal point in a uh, number of uh, uh, situations. And she uh, brings uh, extensive knowledge and experience in coordination and management on criminal justice responses to transnational organized crime and illicit trafficking. And she will speak to this uh, really very uh, useful uh, um, Team build resilience against a range of maritime threats through AI technology-based uh, maritime domain awareness. Uh, 
tools, MDA tools, which will be incredibly useful to Sri Lanka in particular. You have uh, the floor, man. Good afternoon. Um, I would love to see your face, but the light is uh, quite strong. But I can notice that uh, there are lots of uh, female uh, participants. So uh, I would like to congratulate the KDU uh, for this uh, gender mainstreaming in the security sector. Um, so the topic that we see today, um, it's, it sounds uh, quite complicated, but it is not. So uh, it is to talk about how we can build the resilience to combat the maritime crime by utilizing the AI technology based maritime domain awareness. And they will go through uh, these different uh, definitions together. Um, so first, when we talk about the resilience in the maritime security, um, that means to have the capacity and the resources um, to prevent and mitigate the impact of a various maritime threats that may affect or harm the marine environment, but as well as the maritime activities and the other interests. And how does the maritime domain awareness uh, I mean, how does having the maritime domain awareness can benefit this? How this can strengthen the uh, resilience in the maritime security? Um, first, we will look into the definition of the maritime domain awareness, because maybe you will be uh, asking for that. Um, so the MDA, maritime domain awareness, MDA is to have the effective understanding of uh, anything associated with the maritime domain they could impact the security, safety, economic, or environment. So as you can see, it has a quite uh, broad uh, definition. Um, and at sea, as you know, there are various threats, first on the security, such as maritime terrorism, piracy, armed robbery that is happening at sea, um, as well as on the safety. For example, when drug is smuggled into Sri Lanka, that affects the uh, health of the uh, population. Um, it can also be the case of the migrants uh, uh, utilizing the, I mean, crossing, the, crossing to the, um, another country, utilizing the unseaworthy vessels. So uh, this um, as safety factor is also concerned. Um, it is also about the economy. For example, the uh, country is losing a lot because of the uh, illegal fishing, for example, and as well as the environment factor. MDA helps to uh, promote the compliance with the uh, environmental regulations. So for example, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. There is also the uh, MARPOL Convention, the several IMO conventions and protocols um, to, um, the related to the marine pollution uh, preventions. So the maritime domain awareness is basically um, um, to understand what is happening at sea um, to um, curb uh, the threats that are posed to the safety, economy, and security, and environment. Um, so if you look into these two pictures, uh, the one, one in the left is what we know. Um, so this is based on the passive detection that is relied on the reception and interpretation of the existing signals, such as the AIS. This is the, what the vessel is emitting. And then this also requires the compliance of the uh, master of the ship, because we need to keep the AIS on on the ship. And if we look at on the left, we only find uh, seven vessels that are at sea. However, if you look into the right, this is the same time, actually. The picture is taken at the same time. Um, with the, uh, thanks to the technology of the AI, we can actually see that there are more than 700 invisible vessels that are actually at sea. So this is what we do not know. Um, so through the active uh, detection methods and technologies, so we could receive and analyze the real-time data on those vessels that are not in compliance. So the use of the uh, artificial intelligence in this maritime domain is uh, super beneficial for the maritime law enforcement officers to analyze the volumes of the data, to identify the patterns, the anomalies, and then the threats in the maritime domain. Um, 
There are multiple information centers. Uh, so as you can see, the first uh, one on the left to, for the covering the Gulf of Guinea, there is uh, the inter ICC that is based in Yaoundé. There is Yaoundé architecture that is established. And the information fusion uh, center is over there. And in the Indian Ocean region, as you can see, we have uh, RMIFC that is in Madagascar, RCOC in Seychelles, as well as the IFC Information Fusion Center for Indian Ocean Region in India. So there are several uh, regional information fusion center where they are coordinating and collaborating with the uh, uh, countries to uh, share those uh, maritime domain awareness. And within this area of responsibility, we could see what is normal and what is not normal. Um, so like on the right one, as you can see, the red, yellow lines are basically showing the vessel traffic, the movement. So this is the way to go to, for example, the Chittagong port in Bangladesh. However, as you can see, a little blue line over there going into the river. So this is the uh, AI, um, through the algorithm, they are analyzing, identifying, so analyzing the strange patterns, not following the big uh, stream, and then analyzing um, these uh, suspicious behaviors, and then uh, giving actually that information to you, so that the, you can have a better informed uh, decision to actually go at sea and then uh, arrest uh, that vessel. So the. MDA ena enables the data collection through the various sources and platforms, as you can see uh, on the left in the green. Satellite, satellite imagery, radars, sensors, cameras, drones, AIS, as I mentioned. VMS is the vessel tracking system for the fishing vessels. And then these, will, uh, these data will go to the MDA integrated, integrated system where um, there will be uh, AI doing the analysis, but of course we would ne still need a human operator to provide the inputs. And that at the end, uh, it will, we will have the detection of the illegal behavior of the ship, and that will identify basically the suspicious vessel for more informed uh, decision and target uh, maritime operation from the law enforcement of agencies. So MDA supports the digital solutions, such as the artificial intelligence as we saw, the blockchain to verify the identity, the origin and destination of the vessels, the cargoes, and to prevent the fraud, smuggling, and money laundering, uh, as well as the cloud computing to store the access and share the data information among the different member states. So this provides the insights that can be used to enhance the capabilities uh, and performance of the solution in the maritime domain. Um, so, for example, with the AIS, basically you can have uh, the information on the position of the ship. Um, there is a platform, AI platform, that is called Skylight, that is available to, for example, Sri Lanka Navy and Coast Guard, um, which, uh, by utilizing the uh, algorithm, they can identify the suspicious behaviors. And then from that moment, they can find out also the history of uh, this dark, the suspicious, uh, dark rendezvous we said, but like a suspicious behaviors. Then of course, we can also cooperate with the international law enforcement agencies, uh, uh, including the Interpol uh, to uh, look into the prior sanctions violator. CVision is another platform for the maritime domain awareness that can see uh, whether the vessel has been uh, respecting the ISPS code. And of course, there is also uh, cooperation can be done with the immigration to try to understand um, the information on the crew members. So as you can see, lots of uh, interagency coordination is required as, though, as well as at the regional level. And fusing all of these data to build a storyline which is to identify basically the, the, the suspect vessels. So real-time data, as I mentioned, this information is real-time. You can, you can see what is happening, where the vessel is moving, where is the suspicious uh, behavior is happening. Uh, MDA system identifies also inefficiencies and risk in maritime operations. So it recommends the optimization strategy. 
like uh, route planning, the, like it, could, it could also support the uh, reduction of the fuel consumption and the maritime security enhancement. And lastly, the MDA serves as a tool um, for maritime law enforcement agencies to secure the uh, digital evidence to bring the criminals to justice. So uh, by continuously monitoring and collecting um, the data from the various uh, maritime sources, for example, the vessel tracking system, as well as the satellite imageries, um, MDA provides a digital trail of the uh, maritime activities. And this can be used, and this can be actually very critical for the investigation phase, because that will help the authority to identify and then track vessels involved in these illegal activities. So MDA is not only to enhance the situational awareness of what is happening at sea, but actually supporting the uh, law enforcement agencies in gathering the real-time data as well as the historical information, supporting the law, law enforcement operations, and then potential the legal proceedings because we could utilize this as a digital evidence to submit at the court. So ultimately, the MDA contributes to the uh, successful prosecution of the um, suspects because of one of the problems and challenges that we've been facing in the maritime security domain is um, is, uh, is related to the uh, difficulty to achieve the legal finish, meaning that we only arrest suspects at sea and they release, or we only seize the, the drugs at sea and then we dump. We don't stop at there. We actually bring the suspects to justice because that is the message that the uh, as uh, the government, but as well as the international community, uh, would like to pass the message to the criminals that actually this is, these actions are not allowed. So um, hopefully uh, that will be uh, useful and then uh, you could uh, further uh, utilize the MDAs in your uh, next functions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, uh, ma'am, for that. Uh, very uh, succinct but uh, substantive presentation. Um, that concludes the uh, list of speakers and I wish to uh, thank them for the, the, the excellent discipline that they maintained as a result. Uh, despite the backlog uh, delay we inherited from the morning session, we are not very behind the, the schedule, somewhat behind the schedule, but I believe we can still have some 10-15 uh, minutes of questions, right? Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, now this is uh, time for questions uh, from the audience, and uh, please uh, do indicate uh, the questions, uh, well, please do frame your questions briefly and indicate uh, to which speaker you would wish to direct the question so that uh, we can uh, expeditiously deal with it. So the floor is open. If you remain silent, I will take it that you will agree with all what they have said and happily close the session. But uh, I'm sure you have some, uh, the, the, the presentations were so substantive and very wide ranging actually. Uh, I'm sure there must be some thoughts uh, springing to your mind. Uh, yes, uh, you can. Good evening, everyone. I'm Major Madhuan Silla from Sri Lanka Army. 
and thank you very much for the panel for your informative uh, presentations. And uh, my question goes to uh, Dr. Rajiv Ranjan. Uh, in an era like uh, we don't have uh, boundaries with our adversaries and we don't know where are the location of them. So in that you brief that uh, artificial intelligence uh, development by the Chinese government and other people, how effort, what kind of effort they have put on this one. So my doubt, so we know that uh, the semiconductors is the uh, most valuable thing uh, once we are doing this uh, coding, programming, everything. Uh, in that aspect, so they have a problem, uh, as you know, with the TSMC, where the, they are leading the sector. And uh, with that capability, whatever the programs or the development done by the uh, Chinese in artificial intelligence for their development, maybe the military assets, so something can be gone into the other sand. So, is there any kind of uh, actions taken to avoid this one or to develop uh, their capacity on this regard? Should I answer or a group of questions? Well, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as you said, that the chip is one of the very uh, crucial element of this uh, artificial intelligence. And there is a uh, US had this Chips Act that were kind of like cutting the access to the uh, U.S. military technology. I think ch Chinese are like uh, developing their own system. And if you remember in 2000, uh, 2020 during the COVID pandemic when there was uh, this trade war and the COVID was like kind of intensifying, uh, we have seen that uh, within a couple of uh, months, uh, Chinese have just changed the whole Android system to what they call it uh, harmony. Uh, so uh, Chinese are like they have the system is already I think there. They're waiting for a right moment to kind of like shift. But of course they don't have uh, much uh, higher end technology. So they were dependent on the U.S. technology. And thereby you see that uh, the US, uh, Chinese scholars and even the Chinese government are not so uh, kind of like rigid uh, with uh, while kind of like having a dialogue also. But at the same time, they have to show that this strategy and the power game. So they're re reluctant to come forward, but they would not go backwards, right? So if you look at uh, the, the discussion with the, uh, the, uh, the US uh, national security advisors or like the Chinese advisors, they are like very promising. Uh, they they uh, recently, the. Uh, trade Secretary of United States had visited uh, Beijing, right? And there was a kind of like cordial relationship. So they are looking forward to kind of uh, reduce the tension between this uh, China and United States so they can continue the relationship because they are not yet fully uh, arrived at the situation where they can be self-sufficient. So. And thereby you see what the Chinese scholars keep saying that the, the trade war or this cheap act or kind of like cutting access to the Taiwanese uh, cheap act is a kind of like crippling uh, the Chinese economy, right? So I would say that it goes both ways. Uh, recently, Chinese have um, cut the market access of one American uh, cheap uh, producing company and there was a huge cry in the United States. So it goes both ways. Thank you. Yeah, yes. So I'm Majim Ran from Sri Lanka Army. My question goes to uh, Dr. Kane C. Price. Sir, uh, it is appreciated that uh, your view on uh, Indo-Pacific region is very important as a country like Sri Lanka, which is uh, very bound to uh, other countries as well. So what my question goes is, within that, what is the spectrum of uh, US scope towards Sri Lanka, which may uh, influence our sectorial transformation in future, immediate future, sir? Sorry, you said uh, the, the, on the spectrum of U.S. towards Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, how how you see uh, Sri Lanka uh, for its sectorial transformation in future? Okay. 
Great, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, we see that Sri Lanka has a, a great deal of potential. Uh, it's a very important country in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, given its location. Um, so I think, you know, moving uh, into the future, the, the fact that uh, so much of the world's shipping goes by Sri Lanka will play a very important role in the development of its economy. Um, of course, tourism will also be uh, another important sector to develop. Um, and uh, I, it, the United States, I think, has a, a relatively small presence here, economically speaking. There's not a lot of American companies um, at the moment. But I think with uh, additional reform, um, a, a stronger investment climate, um, that could change. And I think particularly one advantage that Sri Lanka might have economically uh, is that it's a very nice place to live, frankly. And so if you are a multinational company uh, or a U.S. company looking to establish a foothold in Sri or uh, establish a foothold in South Asia, uh, people might prefer to live in Colombo. It, it might be a, a nicer place to do business from rather than some of the other countries in the region. So I think Sri Lanka has a lot of advantages that it could, uh, that it could utilize as it develops its economy. Thank you very much. Well, my question is to Professor Jimbo. Uh, you were speaking about the Japan expanding uh, its uh, military capabilities and also investing in standoff weapons, long strike range. Uh, I was wondering, is Japan looking at uh, developing also its your industrial defense industrial base? Because one of the challenges major countries are facing with the Ukraine Russia uh, is the question of defense industrial base. Uh, is Japan? I mean, as you said, Japan will partner with many countries, including the U.S. But are you looking at expanding your defense industrial base in the long run? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think many of you have been aware that uh, Japanese post-war uh, experience on the um, limiting the uh, Japanese defense industry to engage uh, in the multinational productions and exports uh, has been long limited the Japanese potential to uh, get into the arms market uh, for long years. But since uh, 2014, when the former Prime Minister uh, Abe and his administration has relaxed the standards, uh, there has been the growing horizon that the Japanese defense industry engaged in the several, uh, I think, a sphere uh, of the uh, engagement, uh, which is going beyond the United States, for example. Uh, one of the important examples with this kind of relaxation, we engage in a much more on the research and development side uh, of the emerging technologies, uh, predominantly with uh, European countries, but uh, that also involves uh, countries like uh, Israel, Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and, and more us. And also, uh, we are now looking at uh, uh, transfer of defense equipment, uh, starting from those uh, capacity building efforts in the coastal areas uh, on the maritime uh, front, but also we, the current Japanese diet, which is the you know, uh, parliamentary, uh, you know, debate is now looking at uh, lethal weapons uh, to be uh, transferred to other countries. And definitely that has been, has to do with uh, our joint production of the next generation fighter. Interestingly, together with the UK and Italy. And, uh, uh, and thanks to the U.S. understanding to let us do this. And, uh, and, and this is uh, also a new, uh, I think, uh, game of the play uh, Japan is currently doing. And I think we do have a technologies, but those technologies are not ready to, you know, collaborate with uh, other, uh, you know, foreign defense uh, industry. Now we are looking forward to much more kind of robust engagement uh, in the future. And as you know, that the defense industry has uh, lots of like a components, and some of, some of them are very much dual use. And in that context, I think we have a, a vast range of opportunity uh, that uh, we can collaborate uh, with uh, countries, including uh, in Sri Lanka and also uh, beyond uh, in, in South Asian countries as well. Thank you very much. Good evening all. Uh, my uh, question goes to the fourth speaker. So, uh, sir, could you uh, please uh, provide some, uh, some of the insights into, into the U.S. approach 
to addressing environmental and uh, climate concerns in the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, I would like to hear from you, and if you could uh, be, uh, be more specific about the uh, support that the U.S. can give to uh, Sri Lanka to fight against the climate change. Thank you. I think that uh, Japan has uh, outlined quite in a detail about uh, how the new plans for the Indo-Pacific will address uh, to those uh, uh, green economy SDGs, uh, climate change concern uh, in Indo-Pacific. And I think that involves the, the uh, I think, a Japanese uh, kind of investment uh, behaviors uh, in order to uh, encourage and uh, cultivate uh, more, uh, you know, industry promotion on the uh, less ca carbon, uh, you know, industry in this region. And that uh, we are committed uh, to the Asia Zero Emission Initiatives uh, and, and that to promote the every government's commitment uh, to the, uh, you know, the less carbon society. And that is uh, uh, number one. And also that uh, uh, I think a climate change also needs uh, lots of like uh, monitoring, uh, administrative, uh, you know, expertise, uh, education uh, on the, uh, you know, younger generation especially. And those processes, I think that there has been a comprehensive uh, plan uh, has been prepared to provide it. Uh, to the, the country in this region. So I think that uh, uh, the, you know, the, those climate challenges, uh, you know, promotion of the SDGs uh, is a kind of multifaceted uh, efforts which uh, involves uh, lots of kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 sub-products of the, uh, the existing kind of uh, product, uh, uh, project management and the lots of like a project financing uh, that is concerned. So I think that the, you know, bringing in those kind of tight regulations uh, on the uh, on the environmental standards whenever that uh, large-scale project goes on and that will become the standardization of the how those uh, you know the project financing may contribute uh, to the future of the uh, the climate challenges thank you any uh, any of the other panelists would like to uh, yes uh, maybe I'll just add uh, addressing climate change is one of the the top priorities for President Biden and we have a, a special presidential envoy for climate uh, John Kerry a former Secretary of State uh, and he has been working very hard uh, uh, working with other countries to uh, get very strong commitments to reducing emissions. Uh, USAID has also uh, ramped up the amount of uh, funding available for climate change. And then again, coming back to the private sector, um, we're really looking to uh, increase the amount of renewable energy uh, in Sri Lanka and, and other countries as we transition away from uh, fossil fuels. And so again, that idea of, of economic reform, attracting more um, uh, investors, making your uh, investment climate more friendly to, uh, to foreign investment is very important to attract the uh, capital needed for the transition uh, to renewable energies. Thank you. Uh, can we have one final question? Uh, thank you, Chair, and the, uh, thank you, panelists. So the, my question goes to Ms. Suji, the last presenter. So your presentation was very interesting in terms of the maritime domain awareness. So. So my question is very straightforward and very simple. Okay, when we really think about the maritime domain awareness, it's absolutely required to have a kind of central AI based, uh, you know, uh, information uh, uh, based. In that sense, when we really think about the geo geopolitical uh, context, especially between US and the China, which are domain with uh, the AI technology uh, in that sense. So how you navigate this? Because I'm pretty sure uh, especially when it comes to US and the China, so they are really skept, uh, skeptic uh, in terms of each other's uh, information provision. So in that sense, how this maritime domain of us could be working, actually? Thank you. Yeah, so there are various um, platforms of the maritime domain awareness. Um, if, so for example, yes, US provide the, uh, the platform called Sea Vision, and that is basically to uh, attract the uh, vessel movement through the AIS. But that's when only the masters put the AIS on. So if they turn it off, it doesn't show in the C vision. So that is what C vision provides, and then this is not AI technology. Um, and this is the government to provide. I mean, the, the U.S. government is providing to the um, to the other member states who are interested to receive uh, 
the platform. Um, the, the AI platform, um, that is also available, but that is nothing to do with the government. So that is uh, from the non-profit uh, organizations who are, uh, for example, the Global Fishing Watch. Um, the Skylight is another um, uh, platform that was uh, built by the uh, uh, foundation. Um, that is providing that uh, technology to the member states who, I mean, the law enforcement uh, agencies of the member states who would like to receive uh, such thing. But at the end, they provide the, the data. I mean, the AI will do their job to analyze um, the, there are the suspicious behaviors. But at the end, it will be the law enforcement agency's decision, analyst decision, because there are still lots of data that the we, the human needs to analyze those data, and then um, give that the, the strategic uh, um, guidance uh, to the operational people to actually go target the vessel or not. So uh, it is not fully yeah, depend on those uh, technology, and then still yeah, those technologies are provided by the uh, NGOs. So I would say there is less uh, risk in that uh, matter. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, if uh, there are no further questions, uh, there is one. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. There are two final questions now. Yeah. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Kevin C. Price. Uh, sir, you mentioned that uh, the U.S. wants to, or like they're trying to align with the countries in the Indo-Pacific region to create collaborations, and that is how you build resilience. So, so uh, as, like, as uh, in Sri Lanka or the other countries, how would we know that the U.S. does not have a hidden agenda? What are the strategies, or how would you approach the countries so that we fully support these partnerships, sir? Very good question. Um, well, I mean, I think it's the, w when we describe the Indo-Pacific strategy, the very first words we use are a free and open Indo-Pacific. And I certainly, I know I do, and all my colleagues at the U.S. Embassy, we try to be as honest and, and candid and transparent as possible. Um, so I don't think it's a, a secret to anyone that they're, the United States is competing with other powers in the region. Um, but uh, we try and be uh, very uh, open about that. And uh, we don't have a hidden agenda. We're not saying, OK, if we can get Sri Lanka to sign on this dotted line, then we've got them on our side. But we want, uh, you know, like the Indo-Pacific strategy says, free and open, prosperous, resilient, connected. And uh, like I said at the outset, we really feel that it's not good for, just for America, but it's good for all of the people and the countries in the region if we can achieve that vision together. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, my question uh, goes to Mr. Kevin. Looks so, like we have uh, many challenges uh, affecting the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, such as climate changes and pandemics. So, as you have mentioned before, what has been come out come out as the fa fair proceeding in, in order to address this during the Indo-Pacific Environment Civil Reform, has it been successful so far? So, I understood you're asking about climate change and has it been yes. successful so far? Well, uh, we, we have a long ways to go. The challenge is uh, immense. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing uh, extreme weather events all over the planet. We're seeing the drought here in Sri Lanka, the United States, uh, just this summer alone has gone through uh, numerous forest fires and, and other weather events that have been likely triggered by climate change. Um, so I think there's some encouraging signs, but I think also most people would agree that uh, the transition has to happen, uh, the transition from moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy has to happen more quickly. Um, so I hope I answered your question. Maybe we can talk afterwards offline. Thank you. I really don't want to look like I'm in a rush to close, but uh, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I would like to uh, not delay our panelists too much uh, because it's uh, somewhat behind schedule. 
Uh, next item says uh, chairperson summing up, but I'm not going to attempt to s summarize or sum up such a rich and uh, wide-ranging discussion with some probing questions. But I oh, want to say that uh, we have had uh, a wide-ranging discussion on these very uh, important, even some of them critical issues that will uh, clearly have a, have an uh, important uh, uh, or defining impact on how uh, the world at large will uh, look like, and our region in particular uh, look like uh, in the 21st century and beyond, and, and importantly, how Sri Lanka and in fact other developing countries should uh, factor these uh, considerations into their calculations um, as they try to define their own posture, position, how to position them in, the, in this uh, digitalizing world, um, be it economic development, uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, security, foreign policy, uh, and all that. So I think um, uh, we have had very ably presented, well-researched uh, facts, figures, uh, um, and opinions, uh, all that will be very useful. And that uh, perhaps some of them would have flagged to you uh, for topics for, for the research and analysis uh, uh, and, and especially policy research and so forth. So I just want to thank uh, the, the very distinguished and very disciplined panel for, for their very uh, substantive contributions. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure the KDU and the students and other participants and we, I myself have immensely benefited from that. And wish to, I also wish to thank the KDU and its uh, able and uh, very hospitable uh, staff for uh, organizing and hosting this meeting. And uh, have a good evening to everyone. Thank you. And I believe we will all leave this auditorium with much food for thought. I would like to once again thank the chairperson Ambassador, retired, HMGS Palihakkara for gracing the 16th International Research Conference with his presence amidst his busy schedule. I would also like to thank the distinguished speakers of the second plenary for Defense and Strategic Studies, Professor Ken Jimbo, Mr. Fred Evans, Dr. Rajiv Ranjan, Mr. Kevin C. Price, and Ms. C.G. Song for sharing their thoughts on the theme digitalization, sustainability, and sectoral transformation. Now, let me cordially invite the chairperson, Ambassador Retired, HMGS Palihakkara, to distribute the certificates for the present. Dr. Rajiv Ranjan.
to do these kind of ceremonies. <laughs> Mr. Kevin C. Price. Miss C. G. Song. We would also like to thank Mr. Fred Evans for joining us virtually to the conference. Thank you, sir, sir, men on stage. Now, I'd like to call upon Colonel R.K.R.P. Ratnayaka, RSP, USP, PSC, Dean, Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel K.D.D.S. Kalansuriya, USP, PSC, Deputy Dean, Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, present the token of appreciation to the plenary chair of session two. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we conclude the second plenary for Defense and Strategic Studies for the 16th International Research Conference. We request you all to join with us tomorrow with the technical sessions as well. Thank you. <laughs>